We'll tell you any shit you want to hear. Multi-armed deities. Twisted and gyrated in provocative and sensual fashion. There is no future. So why not just burn the whole fucking thing down? People are so evil. I wish I could find a Hitler today and go kill him. <laughs> what a time to be alive. Welcome to the Nostalgia Trap AMFM. This podcast has been assembled by robot historians from the future who are trying to understand why the Earth is destroyed and all the humans and plants and animals are dead. This episode is about climate change, which, if we are understanding it correctly, is when humans literally burned the entire planet to the ground just so they could have smartphones and unlimited streaming pornography. The following is a recording of two semi-educated individuals as they attempt to come to terms with an epic tragedy of planetary proportions. This episode is brought to you by Taco Bell's Waffle Taco. Yo quiero Taco Bell. Please enjoy. This is Channel 6 on the spot news. When news breaks, we're there. Capturing news as it happens. Channel 6, we make the news. Go ahead. Sir, can quiet, you state... Quiet, can, Mr. President-elect, go ahead. Can you, you state categorically... She's asking a question. Mr. Don't be Mr. President-elect, can you give us a question? Don't be You're rude. You're attacking us. Can you give us a question? Don't be rude. No, I'm not going to give you a question. I'm not going to give you a can question. You can you state categorically... You are fake news. Fake news. Fake news. I call the fake news the enemy of the people. Fake news. It's fake. It's fake. Phony. Fake. 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 Yeah, fake news. Uh, <laughs> our president currently thinks that climate change is fake news, and like, I mean, the, just, I mean, the words "fake news" are kind of like a brilliant piece of uh, of sinister propaganda. Um, but, but the fact that we have a president now in 2017 who not only is uh, you know a worthless person when it comes to doing anything about climate change, which we've which we've had basically f- as as a president for uh, many terms now. I mean, I would say Obama was a worthless person when it came to doing anything substantive about climate change. Mm-hmm. But Trump doesn't even accept its reality, mm-hmm. which is like a whole other. I mean, I, I mean, you talk about like you know taking the. Taking the marker back a few steps, I mean, this is like I think about like you know the uh, the Al Gore documentary and then the Leonardo DiCaprio documentary. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've had we've had documentaries, Justin. Mm-hmm. We've had we've had years of documentaries, mm-hmm. you know, by celebrities. We've known about this for decades, for over half a century. Try to have a conversation with anyone about climate change, people just tune out. Oh fuck you! Fuck you, pal. Uh, I thought this was a this was a, a, a done and done in terms of mm-hmm. people at least believing the reality of it. But mm-hmm. we've discovered, and maybe this is another thing that smug liberals have discovered, is that there's a section of the population that that accepts that uh, uh, that, that climate change is fake, and that the whole idea of climate change is actually a conspiracy by those very celebrities mm-hmm. as some form of social maybe racial control mm-hmm. um so where are you on that i i, I you're, you're you're not I, I mean i don't think that you think climate change is a false flag <laughs> uh, no i don't <laughs> in fact i know and i know that uh, people who listen to this show and people who listen to the the early iteration of the show called topical fever know that my guest today justin rogers cooper uh has a deep passion for uh, uh the idea of climate change and as, as a as a a biological and environmental reality, but also uh, as a political reality. It's something that, I mean, it's this is a hobby horse for you, right? I mean, you've I, taught I, classes on climate change. I guess so. I th- well, you know... I, I, it must be weird for you it, in the, it, the sense that you've spent so much time thinking about climate change to have a president that doesn't believe it's real. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd say about me is just it's hard to say that I have a deep passion for it or that I'm doing anything special uh, in, in a in a year of Standing Rock and uh, people taking real committed direct action. You know, like I tip my hat 
to people who actually put their body on the line. And so, yeah, you're sitting you know, here reading goddamn books about it. Yeah. But I mean, I will say that, I, you know, I, I don't mean to be corny about it, but, but, you know, teaching people is, 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 is it's not necessarily like, you know, direct political action in terms of disrupting the society, but it is, you know, it's an important, well, why, why don't I, we, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think it was important. Let's get one of the hidden truths though, behind the fake news climate change. Cause yeah. I think that's probably more topical. Yeah. Um, you know, when people say, you know, climate change uh, is a hoax, that's the word, Yeah. Uh, perpetrated by the globalists in right. order to uh, exert more of their control over the planet. Mm. You know, uh, you know, to be fair, it, this notion that like a team of people is going to uh, have to take control in order to save the rest of uh, the planet yeah. is, you know, not outside the ballpark as one of the uh, potential uh, futures that we all are staring uh, uh, staring at. In other words, an authoritarian government has come to power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, given the reality of climate change, yeah, I think the authoritarian government is here to stay. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like this idea that you're adjusting to the Trump era means that you're adjusting to Trump. No, you know, that's not what it is. Or, you know, Trump is going to build the wall and then the next person is going to tear it down. No, they're not. You know, mm -hmm. or like Trump's going to build the deportation prisons and then they're going to be empty in 10 years. No, they're not. You know, like every There's a continuity in other words. Yeah, and every we, We've been lockstep for that's a right. while. And yeah. I, and I think I think one of the very deep ironies yeah of our moment is that the architecture of the prison planet, you know what I mean? This architecture of surveillance. To borrow from Alex Jones. Uh-huh. Yeah. That this architecture and this infrastructure of containment of uh, switch points, of checkpoints, choke points, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that this whole uh, way to think about the regimentation of travel. Uh, the normalization of torture. The, the control of borders. Mm, it, I mean, it just goes on and on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is a horror that you and I could catalog on a whole other show. Yeah. It's just like, what are the steps towards fascism in not only in the United States, but a, a, across the world? Uh, yeah. The, the, you yeah. know, you read the tea leaves and it's not really reading tea leaves. In other words, uh, this is just... Uh, this is just the hard facts of our political reality. Well, and the thing is, what that's the irony, is that the Trump regime is the hard fact of our ecological reality. Mm. You know, And if you look at the hysteria over ISIS and refugees, and uh, as my uh, friend Jared just showed in his movie, uh, Age of Consequences, if you look at the Syrian civil war as itself an effect of a drought exacerbated by right, climate change, right, right. not only is the Syrian civil war, to me, the canary in the coal mine of the entire global system, uh, but in different in ways that aren't just about collapse, but in the ways that are about rearrangement and and displacement. But we'll see Syria again and again. Yeah, yeah. Is what you're saying is that like the and, and this is something that I think you know has kind of been lost in all the talk about Syria is that you know there's a ecological component to what happened in Syria and what continues to happen and i mean syria has been for those who have watched the adam curtis hyper normalization movie that i've brought up a couple times in the show like that uh you know syria has been been in chaos for a long time but but the, the the latest iteration of that chaos has been has been this drought that that began a few years ago mm -hmm. and, is, and 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 basically flooded people into the cities and created the political crisis That's right. that and it's, it's tearing the country apart now. Well, and it's also it's driving European politics. Yeah, yeah. It it played out in Brexit. It's but there would be so. I mean, it's, it's it's almost insane to think of many many Syrias happening at once. That's but, right. But that's that's what we're heading for. That's right. For. And you know, I think Amitav Ghosh's book, The Great Derangement. Yes. I think Roy Scranton's book, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, are both books that really say, if you want to understand what the future of climate change is, at a certain point, you have to start uh, stop thinking about, uh, you know, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And right. you have to do two things. One, you have to look back and say that the or whole... Or even being sad about polar bears. That's right. That the whole history of modernity is about carbon power. Right. Um, and that no one's going to give up carbon power. You know, the U.S. military is the largest consumer of oil. But so is, you know, in other words, all militaries need that oil. The only way to project Isn't power... Isn't like irony is that the military is the consumers of oil when they're also like the the ones that are like enforcing the, the kind of like geopolitical arrangements by which that oil is obtained? And they're the <laughs> ones doing the most to plan for climate change if you go see Jared's film. Yeah, in yeah. other words, you know, the military, there's no doubt about climate change. They're planning for it. And so if you if you take all this into so consideration... I mean, how does that fit into the Trump? Uh, well, here's I mean, how. That's here's one way it fits: is that yeah. the architecture of, of authoritarianism is here to stay. It's it's the permanent future unless right. 
we do something to rearrange the, the deep causes of not only our politics and our political realities, but, but climate change itself. In other words, if we, if we only imagine that the solution to the climate crisis is going to come out of a debate between partisan religions. Yeah, right. The, the debate is, the time is almost up. The debate's almost over. It doesn't even matter at a certain point. And I think there's two key takeaways here. One, you know, those refugees out of Syria just put a lot of cheap labor into Europe. Mm -hmm. So in other words, disaster capitalism style, up to a certain point of just total planetary annihilation, the displacement of labor is in ter terms of the triangle trade and in terms of immigration out of Europe to North America, etc. The displacement of labor, cheap labor going across oceans and through borders in order to work with questionable citizenship status or no rights at all, that's the driving force of cheap uh, of, of, of cheap bodies for capital for hundreds of years. In other words, well, this is going to do some people some favors, especially at a time when wages are rising in places like China. So you see it as doing some people some favors in terms of capitalism benefiting from this. Well, in, in terms of, uh, do, you, do you mean like capitalism having a, a tighter control over the flow of people? Yeah, but also that, uh, yeah, capitalism needing migration in order to continue functioning because it's always needed migration. Right. And that climate change as it drives migration is going to actually help propel uh, uh, the forces of accumulation. Here's Ghosh. You know, so like people will be, in other words, capitalists will be able to profit and benefit until the very final hours of human existence. <laughs> Yeah, and, th and that'll yeah. lead me into my second point. So, right. so it's like eats itself into the final seconds. Yeah, well, you know, in the, we'll think about that. Here's Ghosh. From this perspective, global inaction and climate change is by no means the result of confusion or denialism or lack of planning. To the contrary, the maintenance of the status quo is the plan. Mm. Boom. Yeah! And so the, my second point for Trump, though, is not only, I mean, every country's going right wing because of xenophobia but what's behind the xenophobia migration and climate so in other words as as the migration just continues to throttle out of control as the equator heats up and all these droughts happen and people are displaced um and this is all prior to once we get real bad migration out of the united states mm -hmm. which let's let's not go there yet my friend because then that's the true craziness but as the, all that happens we're going to see the rise of authoritarian governments all around the world that's what we're seeing now we're seeing the collapse of liberal democracies across the planet you know merkel's the last liberal etc right right so that's going to continue to happen and it really you know trump may as well be the bad face for it um uh, but he's not certainly going to be the last face and the smarter people will come after him that'll continue his policies. In some ways, they need Trump to do all these things because while it's happening, we're all so distracted by the idiocy of the figure that we're kind of losing sight of why this is actual, actually rational for the system. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and so the other thing that go back into history and when people say, oh, Trump here, we, we're losing progress. You know, like this progressive uh, idea that that history is linear and that once you achieve certain things, you've achieved them. It doesn't make any right, sense. Right, and it doesn't slide back doesn't, ever. Yeah. Yeah. And so the thing that we really have to watch out for sliding back towards, in my opinion, is yeah. North America is a continent full of genocides. Mm -hmm. why, are there, why are they all back there? Europe is a continent full of genocides. Why are they back there? You know, in other words, you know, like we, all the genocides. When you say back there, what do you mean? In the 20th and 19th century. Right. You know, right. like. Why not, haven't we had a good genocide in a while is what you're saying. Well, I'm just saying, I, I, if you look to the or past. Stay tuned, right? I you mean, look to the past. Yeah. And it's like, my God, unimaginable horror and suffering at scales that we still watch uh, Netflix documentaries about. Yeah. And, and people that uh, are alive today lived through. Mm -hmm. Really? I agree. And exactly. It's, World War II killed 85 million people. I, I mean, I, I really think that 60 to 70. If the, event, <laughs> if the events happened, yeah, who's counting, right? That's one. One million people dead. Two. Two million people dead. Three. Three million people dead. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, if, if there's a false flag, right? I, I mean, if. if, if if those events of World War II happened today, right now, if we started in with that, I mean, people would be losing their minds. It's hard to even contain in this, re in like, in this, like, kind of, like, snarky Facebook reality. Mm -hmm. And I know that, like, it's a privilege to even exist in that reality that a large portion of the global population is not in that snarky Facebook reality. But a large portion is, like, how that population takes on 
Auschwitz, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, how it takes... I mean, we've seen hints of it, certainly. But, like, uh, to go back to, like, weather and politics, I think about, like... I mean, Hurricane Katrina was 2005. It's 12 years ago now, mm-hmm. right? Wow. And, like, so one of the, like, biggest things to come out of that in terms of, like, a take... In terms of a pop culture takeaway was like Kanye West saying George Bush doesn't care about black people. The destruction of the spirit of the people of southern Louisiana and Mississippi may end up being the most tragic loss of all. George Bush doesn't care about black people. And taking it back. Right, and taking it back later. <laughs> um, but either way, mm-hmm. the moment is important, right? Mm-hmm. And, and what I mean by the moment being important is that you, you have a, a weather event. And like I don't know if Katrina is a climate change storm it's hard to say thing about things like that mm-hmm. but either way katrina was a, a, was a, a referendum on george w bush well and it's all I, again and like it became yes. a, it became a much larger story about politics and race and class in america mm-hmm. right and it feels like what you're saying is that you know the whatever weather whatever weather is in store for us we can expect that there will be because of the kind of like already present like chaotic politics Mm -hmm. those politics will become even more chaotic and unpredictable and savage totally savage right you know and whether katrina wasn't necessarily caused by climate change but the reaction and response to katrina was our first glimpse into the american politics of climate change in other words like the the response was all bound up in climate change politics uh it's it's a test case it's a model you know and it's an event it's a climate event yeah without necessarily being tied to a cause and the reason i kind of bring up all the kind of scary stuff about the future is just in the same way in one of our uh, last shows about false flags that you saw the surge the insurgency of right-wing false flag conspiracy narratives go to the mainstream center yeah to me, the the return echo, the uh, the surge to the center that's coming, is that the kinds of sort of hysterical claims people like us are making will continually become recentered into the into the very mainstream of political discourse in the next ten to fifteen. Oh, years. Oh, that's good. So it's like there's a little push and pull. The alt right gets their craziness into the center, and we get a little bit of our craziness. And the and the way we get a little bit of our craziness, the bitter pill that we have to swallow is we have to see. Uh, you know the things, the the really kind of like macabre thing, visions that we've had about climate change. That certainly we're not the only. I don't. I don't think we're the only mm-hmm. apocalyptic thinkers in the culture. In fact, I think the culture is quite apocalyptic about this stuff. Mm-hmm. To see that stuff will become reality. The 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 you know the I told you so that we get from it or people like us get from it is going to be a kind of bitter. That's right. I told you so because of what it will mean is, you know, we'll be witnessing. You know, whatever it, it might be will be uh, uh, unpleasant times a billion, right? Yeah. And, you know, one thing that kind of puts what we're saying into context is you know, in that film, Age of Consequences, you know, the military has a very professional, sophisticated discourse. You know, like sure. when you listen to uh, these generals, ex generals, or retired generals, and these consultants and all the people that Jared interviews in that film. Um, when you listen to them talk, you know, they do it in a calm way, but the things that they're imagining in terms of, uh, conflict zones yeah. and, uh, population control, uh, is really just on par with the things that we're describing. It's just that, you know, someone like me, my tone is a little bit nuttier than theirs yeah, yeah. and you should probably take them you know, more seriously than me. But one of the examples from the film is, you know, already, um, India has put a, uh, a militarized fence around its entire border with Bangladesh. Mm. And so Bangladesh is one of those countries that will the wall that yeah, exactly. they've already done it. Yeah. 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 And so the, the, you know, the wall politics are global. So in other right, words, right. Bangladesh is one of those countries that's particularly, uh, the, the, at build, sea level. build the wall is just a, that, that chant of like a bunch of people at a monster truck rally type shit that, that happens at Trump rallies. That's just a really kind of like, a uh, grotesque and perfectly American version of an impulse that's happening globally. That's right. We aren't the exception. Yeah. Uh, and the wall will become the rule. You know, hung, you know, Hungary's building the walls for the the refugees and the migrants. They're all going to build walls. You know, and it's it's going to be, um, you know, a good time to make money if you're in the cement business. But in Bangladesh, these it's in a flood zone. The only time I'm in favor of the wall is if fucking Pink Floyd is playing it and it's in its entirety. <laughs> 
Hey, buddy, we're gonna take you over to the tent now, all right? Having a bad time here, man. I wish this thing was over. It will end. Everything's gonna be cool. In India, it has an armed border. It's definitely gonna be armed when the people are running up against those gates. But once you see these images in the film, you know, it's like a fe- it looks like a prison fence, like mm-hmm. a fence with yeah. barbed wire, and then another fence. You know, and you can imagine up against that, you know, up against that fence, tens of thousands, hundreds of people. And you can you can see them the way that you can see the Syrian migrants, you know, in places like Hungary and in Eastern Europe going up against, you know, in these like kind of uh, by uh, by rail yards and train stations, you know, echoes of World War Two. Sure. You can see these people up in, up in these spaces with guns pointing at them, holding their children up to the fences. That is is the inescapable tragedy that is uh, not only happening now to real people, yeah. uh, but it's going to continue to happen at, at a greater scale. And so one of the things I like about the Roy Scranton book, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, um, is that you know his his message is twofold. One is like, if, and this is why we should be talking about this, yeah, yeah. is you know, from just a personal perspective, if you don't think about this, you're, you're, you're not, you're going to be caught off guard again. Like the the next right. Trump, you the only way to predict what's going to happen is to seriously think about the instability that that is here. Yeah, and that we're already electing presidents based off of that instability. What, you know whether the phantoms and the fantasies that drove the narratives that elected him are real or not. They're gonna become real, and, and yeah, you know, and, and that's that that denialism is everywhere. And and, and if there's one good thing that might, may come out of the Trump election in terms of the the kind of liberal elite that are close enough to the halls of power to be able to actually do anything about climate change, is waking them up to the idea that anything can happen now. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, like I mean, for for the months and months and months that Trump was running, the entire establishment media. And I'm even including myself in some respects, just did not see that he could possibly ever be president. It, I mean, mm-hmm. to the point where, of course, uh, we're a couple shocking. months into his presidency now, the the establishment media is still tr- looking for a way out. They're still like have their like their hands over their ears being like, la, 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 la. They really like, uh, hopefully he'll be proven to be a Russian agent yeah. and kicked out of there. In other words, they're not coming. In other words, that, that maybe that that. They didn't learn a lesson, and Do you that, know and what's that they're gonna still happen? living in a reality that they think the rules of the old world still apply. Do you know what would happen if the tax returns were released and there was nothing in them? Yeah, you know that's just something that everyone needs to kind of consider. Is I don't the, think anything would happen. They well, people would. Right? I think a lot of people would freak out. Yeah. In other words, like, there's, but he's not gonna. It's not gonna change his. It's not gonna. He's not gonna not be president anymore, right? Well, what if, okay, you know, it's a different conversation. But yeah. The tax yeah, yeah. return is the, is like this conspiracy event. So yeah. like what's in the tax return? Right, right. Everyone's holding on to the unknown. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the Trump card. Sure. You know? <laughs> and so without, without being here or there. He's there. I mean, the reality is for me is that he's there. And like the larger point I was making was about like the idea that, you know, liberals, the people that are. Uh, the the people that are anti-Trump now, mm-hmm. um, you know, they they haven't really they will be they will be blindsided by the next climate event. Maybe maybe not, right? You know, but it, it, and, it, and I, mean, I don't mean the climate event. They believe in climate change. I mean like the political element of it that you're talking about. That's right. Like which way climate climate is going to spin us? Because again, like most people don't know that Syria is even a climate thing, right? And I know that Syria's politics are much more complicated than just the drought. But like most people don't understand that like the the, the the immediate impetus for it has been the has been weather related. Well, and you know the other thing to think about with the whole climate thing is you know does it like so Trump's EPA uh, executive yeah, doesn't right. believe in climate change and Trump doesn't believe in it whatever whatever. Okay, well, so so what? It, nothing was happening under Obama anyway, which is to say, yeah, there's a Paris Agreement. Maybe they're going to rip it up. What fucking good was the Paris Agreement, really? You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it didn't stop anything from happening. And is so, it, what's the name of the DiCaprio documentary? It's like the final hour, the eleventh hour. Not only is it the eleventh hour, it's eleven fifty nine. It's an interesting documentary, right? But isn't the idea of the eleventh hour meaning me, like basically doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's too late in some respects to really prevent the like most catastrophic stuff about and and I don't mean like the Earth being dead. I mean human beings disrupting themselves. Well, see, that's to me the logic of the the kind of genocidal equation we talked about earlier. Yeah, you know, so like okay, more prisons, more hard borders, 
internal displacements, more m- climate migrants. Like I, I when I taught that uh, Scranton book last fall, mm-hmm. I just kept imagining like myself as the migrant. You know, right. why would I? Know? I'm so fucking privileged. Yeah, and I'm teaching to a lot of students that are immigrants and have you know coming from other places and you know in in. Um, you know, and in, in, in trying to make a different life in a different country. Something in that, all sorts of situations more precarious than the ones we've found. Really ourselves. precarious, yeah. really mm-hmm. precarious. And I'm like, you know, it, it would be the height of uh, arrogance if I didn't imagine myself at a minimum in a desk in a classroom learning from someone else in a different country. Right. Like that is my future yeah. on, on some level. But also it would be the height of arrogance, really just dumb dumb denialism to think that you know at a certain point i'm not going to have to move like them mm-hmm. you know and so you know one of the way you know most I, americans I, don't think that way though like i mean you're you're a thoughtful person it's like kind of anticipating that I and mean, it takes like a leap of empathy that you know i think of a lot of them the people that would like even people that are accept the reality of climate change americans have like protection of what is theirs that is so tight that they will to the death, defend their right to have it against the hordes that are coming. Get off my land! Get off my property! Leave me alone! There's a lot of empathy for property. Right, exactly. And, 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 and you know, I was talking to my students the other day about the Underground Railroad, right? And the, the, uh, when I was young, I thought of the Underground Railroad as Harriet Tubman with an engineer cap on on some like train, literally some tr- on literal railroad. Right. And it took me a while to like actually realize that the Underground Railroad was uh, really just a system of safe houses. People uh, took in families and individuals that were fleeing from slavery mm-hmm. and kept them safe until they could find another place. And the people that did this, and white and black people. That mostly white, I would I, I would guess that owned the houses, but I, I could I, I think that black people were kind of the soul of this movement in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I think Harriet Tubman made something like sixteen trips back into the South to, uh, which is just extraordinary. I mean, it's just incredible insane. under threat of death, right? So, so incredible. I, I, and think about like they we're fighting over whether she should be on the twenty dollar bill over Andrew Jackson. That's another story. I think Harriet Tubman is fantastic. I would love to. I would love to leave Andrew Jackson and see if we can maybe come up with another denomination. Maybe we do the two dollar bill or we do another bill. I don't like seeing it. Yes, I think it's pure political correctness. I know Cherokee people who don't like twenty dollar bills just because they see President Jackson on them. I mean, Harriet Tubman is just one example. There, I mean, you you know that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of other people. That did it under risk of death, arrest, imprisonment, etc. They brought families into their homes and and sheltered them and, and got them to the next location, right? So that's a story that's just. I mean, I don't. I don't know why there hasn't been a movie about it. I mean, it's just this story of like it's extraordinarily well, expi- inspiring. Jesus. All the things they refuse to make movies about. Is- right. So then I was thinking about refugees because I'm walking through Park Slope the other day. And I see all these signs. You may have seen them in Park Slope, in like this, in these, uh, in the windows of they're in Crown Heights too. Yeah, in the windows of brownstones that are owned by doctors and lawyers and professors and uh, and what I would call the professional, the professional managerial class, liberals in Park Slope, right? And they've got these signs that say like "Refugees Welcome Here," "Safe Zone for Refugees." And like part of me is very, my heart is warmed by that, by that. I see that. I'm like, that's great. But then I think about if I actually brought. Uh, a Syrian family to this house right now, 10 a.m. on a Wednesday morning, and knocked on their door and said, I've got a family here, a man, a woman, two children. They don't speak any English. They need everything right now. They need clothes. They need medicine. They need food. They need water. They need protection, money, etc. Are those families in Parksville? And I don't know the answer to this. Because I'm really just asking Socialism. about like, what is the level of risk? Are those families willing to take the, uh, those families in? Because that's what the, the Underground Railroad is an example of that we need more of in mm-hmm. our society, whether we're combating and thinking about climate change or whatever the fuck. We need people who are willing to put themselves at risk of arrest and put themselves at risk of death and give up their very comfortable Park Slope lifestyle to help these people in a profound way. And, and I, you know, I, I, I'm not taking myself off the hook here at all. You know, like how willing am I to put anything on the line? But like, it seems like if the, and, and this is again paraphrasing like Terrence McKenna, if the people that are like 
the closest to the good news and the furthest from the bad news. If those people are so comfortable already, what 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 is it that will drag them out of that? Well, a lot of abolitionists, including Lincoln, were quite comfortable with the idea of ending slavery and deeply uncomfortable with the idea of living next to a black person. Well, there you go. Number one. Number two. Um, the liberal imagination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. People people want to save the people that are far, not the people that are near. But two, this you I- can just give a dollar. A dollar a month will save this little child in Africa and you'll get a picture of him in the mail. Right? Do you remember those commercials? Yeah, they're uh, still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's what I think of when I think of like the long distance of of compassion. <laughs> sure, <laughs> right? I agree. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, you know, putting the putting it on individuals is itself a liberal sure. narrative. Yeah, yeah, and so that's why I was. I'm guilty of that too. Yeah, right? Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. You know, socialism is something to think through as an alternative here. It always has been, always will be. Third, what do you it, mean by that? that? Socialism as an alternative to thinking about Park Slope liberals? Yeah, yeah. In other words, socialism means that you don't, you yeah. yourself, don't have to, uh, you know, personally become responsible for another person. That you pool resources. Yeah. With a right. lot, at a scale. And the, then you can cr- ah, create. Okay. So it's actually, I like what you're saying here because, like, it's actually, again, capitalism is the problem here. It's not the Park Slope liberal. It's the fact that Park Slope liberal lives under capitalism that, 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 that yeah. makes it very, very personally difficult and demanding to Fuck yeah. help people. Like, capitalism actually makes it, like, with, outside of your interest to help people. That's right. And the yeah. thing is, that's also part of the politics of climate change. Sure. And, which is, you can't do anything. Right. Fuck yourself yes. and anything you're going to do. Right. You can't stop it. The only thing that's going to stop this is, you know, really concerted scales of networked people in systems and institutions. In other words, this is a global problem. It's going to take a global people's movement to even get around some of the most horrific things that are coming for us. It's not going to, I don't think it's ever going to come for them. In other words, the, right. uh, the annihilation, no, we're all dead, but like they're going to be in their pods. And, that, and, and that's the long way to go back to the genocide thing, which is, yeah. you know, I don't, you know, it, it's, it's creepy. It sounds like Alex Jones, you know, like the, the Georgia, the Georgia stones, you know, yeah, right. the globalists are going to bring it down to 500 million people <laughs> and they're going to put you in the prison camp. You know, it's like, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. you know, the thing is, again, it's kind of like it's right for the wrong reasons uh-huh. in a kind of exaggerated way. But it's like, like when you think of the globalists, uh, 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 <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like a, like a, an Alex Jones insane thing. But like at the same time, you like globalists. What is it? The Georgia Godstones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What is a globalist? <laughs> Ah! Ah! We're coming for you, globalist. Ah! Coming for you. Coming for you. We know what you're doing. Ah, I'm sorry. I know for him, that's a very like. I think he's thinking of like five Jewish guys in an yeah. underground bunker somewhere. But we, I mean, you've 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 tinkered with these ideas before. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, well again, I think it's all funhouse mirror. In other words, yeah. I think a lot of lies are true for the wrong reasons. I think a lot of conspiracies are false, but reveal hidden truths, uh, both emotionally and otherwise. But I also just want to say one more thing about that specter of genocide, which for even the liberal who believes in science, you know, and now we're getting books like the Scranton book and the gauche, right. which are putting that stuff out there and it's being published by, you know, capitalist presses. You know, in other words, like, you know, people get the scale of the crisis and they get the possibility of destruction. City, like Aleppo's gone. New Mm -hmm. Orleans took a hit. Yeah. New York was a near miss with Sandy. You know, we saw people starting to fire weapons at gas station lines. The point that I'm making here is like, you can, you can see the tripwire. Sandy was a preview of what's to come, my friend. And I think that's what's scary about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because because even, I mean, Sandy, you say it was a near miss, but it was an extraordinarily destructive storm. Yeah, and I, I don't, I don't think I'm not in denial about it. I mean, the other side of it is, well, it's coming. And I think there's an element of just hitting snooze. You know, it's like people get it. A lot of people do get it. I think millions of people understand. Well, yeah, there's no there's no better way to like kill a party than to be like, hey, did you guys know that the Arctic Arctic shelf is melting and we'll all be dead in 50 years? The most vulnerable part of the Earth's ecological system is the atmosphere. Vulnerable because it's so thin. Fuck you. 
Yeah, that's my message to you. Fuck you and kiss my ass. I mean, if you actually bring up like just the New York Times it, it article that a, came out a year, what yeah, two two years ago that said that. I mean, and, and it's kind of like accepted fact among among all scientists, right? Or most scientists that aren't paid off. Mm-hmm. That like New York will be New York City will be like significantly underwater in fifty yeah. years. We well, like well, I, I do the math. I'm like, well, I'm, I plan on like I plan on like being here, yeah, or at least it's it's a bad long term investment, yeah, right? Um, yeah, and also it's some sort of like cyborg version of me, might yeah, be, yeah. And I think it's way. it's also kind of like well, you know, yeah, you don't really want to. F- Fart at the party. Sure. I bring this up. And I also, speaking of New York headlines, New York Times headlines, to me, that headline you're talking about is also connected to like, there are more people displaced globally now than any other point in human history besides World War II. 60 million people. Yeah. Half of them are children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are walking the planet. And, and, and the other great statistic is that uh, the average stay in a refugee camp, of which there are tens of millions of people around the world mm-hmm. in refugee camps, the average stay in a refugee camp is 17 years. Did you fucking know that? The, that the average stay in a refugee camp is 17 years? That means that I mean, these aren't camps. You, you know, these are prisons. These are, these are prisons for the mm-hmm. portion of the population that the planet, whatever, the planet systems, human systems have failed to really contain and we're at the we're at the point you talk about like oh, people that talk about overpopulation yep we're at the point where we're actually not containing with the human beings on this planet that's right and we're, and, and we're not able to contain them in any humane way and we're actually throwing a, a, a significant portion of the world's people in the garbage that's right here's here's scranton while the rest of us kind of hit the snooze button well, and let's. And, I wanna, that, and that's tricky. Uh, yeah, and let's that talk is about tricky the, shit. The snooze is a complex idea, and, yeah. I, and it, it is happening. Scran writes: We experience this world of strife today in one of two modes. Either it is our environment, right, and we are in it, or it comes to us as images, social excitation, retransmitted fear. Yeah, people are fighting and dying in ruined cities all over the planet. Neighbors are killing each other. Ooh, old good. women, You know it or you don't know old it. Old women are bleeding to death in bomb rubble and children are being murdered probably as you read this sentence. To live in that world is horrific. Constant danger strains every nerve. The only things that matter are survival, killing the enemy, reputation, and having a safe place to sleep. The experience of being human narrows to a cutting edge. Mm. See, that's why we're hitting this news. Is I think a lot of people understand you're gonna you're either gonna live, barbarism surrounds us yeah you're either going to live in that world you're gonna know people that have lived in that world or you're if you have kids you're gonna watch them live in that world and then you understand something like like when you watch the walking dead or game of thrones you know it's it, this is the repressed yeah. you know this is the violence that is all around you being kind of like redeployed into characters and and stories and chapters uh, that become sensible forms of entertainment and sort of what 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 Scran's calling excitation, excitement. Hun T, did you see the season premiere of Game of Thrones? Uh, does Cersei have family secrets? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to me, the consumption of horror, the consumption of violence. Um, isn't just about a sort of uh, visual pleasure or a narrative pleasure. I really do think that it's a way of staying in touch with how the other half lives. Yeah. And it's a way to keep alive in yourself um, those uh, crisis moments uh, so that if you are confronted with them, uh, you're, you have stories that are already teaching you how you'll behave. You know, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. that I, I, I they, the Walking Dead is popular because, it, uh, and, and that's almost like a, a on the surface kind of popularity is that it's a training for the coming apocalypse. I mean, yep. people kind of it's like this the weird tongue in cheek thing in the yep. culture that like this oh I'm training for the zombie apocalypse ha ha ha. Uh-huh. But like we you and I have talked about before like what that zombie represents to most people, and I mm-hmm. mean that is the refugee, that is the other, that is poor people coming from the city, that is people of color. Mm-hmm. I mean, the zombie represents the, the, the fear of the, the, the hordes coming to vomit into your mouth and to kill your kids. That is such an enervating idea for all of American history mm-hmm. that it's not, 
it's 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 perfect that it, that the denouement of American history would be to like watch that happen, yep. and whether it's an imagined future or not. I mean, th- th- that's that's something that is a big element, I think. In to all me, of the it. most important character in any zombie story is the one who kills the zombies. Right, is because I you have to retain the imagination of murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you have to. The, the, that's the only violence is the way you maintain your individuality. And it's the, it, against I, I, uh, against uh, uh, I mean it, it, these stories are anti-communist sto- stories too in a lot of ways right it's like it's 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 like you can't imagine solidarity or community with like you know the the, the hordes of gross disgusting zombies but you do produce at least in that show Walking Dead not that I finished it yeah but you do produce solidarity among the survivors right and, the, right. and the, to that sense that notion of violent solidarity mm-hmm. to me is a back end way of thinking about the that's all um, of politics is the politics of the survivors but it's also a back end way to think about the sort of uh, horizontal politics of insurgency mm, mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah. and i think here's the here's the hard truth you know to me yeah this is where all this is going sure is that the thing that we think about is like there are people dying and bombs exploding they're happening everywhere around the world right now uh, just what the, that scran quote etc but the other thing that's happening in syria isn't just people who are victims it's insurgent movements and it's uh what i guess what you call in some cases terrorist organizations but in other other you what else do you call those like the free syrian army it's it's people mobilized with machine guns and heavy weapons mm. killing other people with military equipment etc okay that's a constant feature of life in the middle east you know it's been a constant feature of life in europe for yeah. you know the first yeah, yeah. half of the 20th century uh it was in yugoslavia not just 25, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can see extraordinarily like violent active networks in places like Mexico uh, along the lines of narcotic trafficking. So routes. you're saying open your eyes to what history is. It's a parade of violence. Well, but here's what I'm saying is you. No, 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 no. That's no, not what I'm saying at all. That's not what you're saying at all. No, that's no. not what I'm saying at all. <laughs> I'm saying if you, um, this is going back to the Park Slope guy. If right. you imagine the future as you yourself being the victim and suffering, yes. don't think of it that way. You're going to be part of an insurgency. Ah. In other words, like the politics of the future that's is, the fantasy. is not like I'm, I'm going to elect a leader that saves me. No, you're not. Mm-hmm. They're never going to save you. The Democrats won't save you. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be a messiah, a political messiah. There's not, and if he is, it'll be authoritarian. Yeah, you know, and so you cannot look to them for answers. At the end of the day, like in all these shows and all these stories, you will have to make decisions, but you won't make them alone. You'll make them with groups of people, and that, in a weird way, toward as we get towards that end, towards that terminal horizon, especially for people like us who won't ever even be in line for the arc. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. We're we're gonna we're not gonna be on the lists you know that's it's just you know if we're going to either be uh, recruited drafted my best you know, hope is that i get a good job as a guard at an extermination <laughs> camp and that you know the hours are decent yeah. and and i get some good benefits i, I, I guess what i'm saying is you know and i think scran would agree with this learning to die in the anthropocene yeah it's not just learning to die literally mm. it's learning to let go of the tablet and <laughs> this microphone and new shoes you know it's like there's the pattern of consumption the, the malls and the cars and you know your own relationship to the carbon economy to carbon power it's it's going to it's going to have to fragment unless of course we have the uh, the, the brand new technology that comes out of the you know the, the savior technology. I mean, it, are, barring, where are you on that whole uh, I just techno utopism? Point, yeah, I'm not. I'm 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 not there. I think yeah. that it's going to be capitalism to the end. Meaning all the things they ever invent will only work for the people with money. You know, and everyone else will either we will either have to unite and in in fight for a brand new system the way that people in San Domingue fought for a brand new system. Right. You know, like the, you're going to have to look to Haiti in the 1790s. You're going to have to look into uh, the uh, the formerly enslaved people that went into Richmond in 1864. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to look to 1877. You're going to have to look towards um, the you know the coal fields of Pennsylvania. You know in the second half of the 19th century. You're going to have to go back and figure out like you know how did groups of people uh, win. Yeah, win against empire. In other words, and win against like um, impossible odds. That's right. So yeah. here's, here's the here's the and here's where I would end with that. Yeah, Rogue One. Yeah, can't believe it got made. You know, because to me that film, 
you know, not to get partisan. You're talking about a fucking Star Wars movie. But, you know, to me, and I want to, we can talk about some other time, but to me, what I really loved about that film is that all Hollywood films are about an individual who overcomes suffering and, like, finds atonement or finds individual meaning. Like, it's about a, a guy or a woman right. who's challenged, and it's, you know, it's a very kind of, like, typical mythology thing. Sure, but sure. It's, it's, it's just endless liberal bourgeois narrative, just without end. No matter mm-hmm. what the setting or scene, it's going to be this man, this woman, this family, and they, this small... Rogue One mm-hmm. is about an insurgent team that brings down key things of the empire and it's not just like we're a horizontal group going up against the bad empire people from in the empire are defecting shit's happening like in a perfect little cascading damn set so of are ways. you saying this film is a, is a is a complicated vision of politics I, I what i liked about it was it wasn't it was a film with individuals right but it was a film about teamwork yeah and it was a film yeah. about how people got things done using violence and strategy and tactics that's amazing and at the end it's like some sort of trojan horse this film and at the end all the people all the people who found solidarity they sacrificed themselves yeah they yeah, died yeah. hey there's no sequel you know so in other words like those they're working char- for the underground railroad and they got blasted for That's doing right. it those characters are gone it's, it was a revolutionary suicide damn you know and so what i what i loved about that it was like oh my god this film they, sounds crazy they are you made, sure you watch it was rogue one you were yeah, watching yeah yeah they made a <laughs> film in which, like, this isn't like a Tarkovsky film or something. You yeah, and it, it's like it's like Shakespearean tragedy because right. at the end of the Shakespearean tragedy, everyone dies, but they get self knowledge. And I, in other words, what I'm saying is we're heading into Act Five for climate change for the planetary emergency. Yeah, yeah. But I, I we're gonna we're gonna get some deep stuff out of it. In mm-hmm, other words, like, mm-hmm. and we're gonna have. And it's not just gonna be like good punk music. Oh man, our, like, our lives are gonna be so deeply meaningful. And the choices we make are going to matter so much. The, the, the things that are going to be most special to us, the most memorable things to come, they're, they're going to be so unlike everything we've already seen in our lives. Wow. I wasn't expecting this to take such a positive turn. Fucking Star Wars. Really? I would never watch those movies because they're racist. Against robots. In my opinion, climate change is exactly like 9-11. If the planet is the Twin Towers and capitalism is the airplanes, and the ice caps are George W. Bush. George W. Bush did 9-11. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for more Nostalgia Trap AM FM, and please visit patreon.com slash nostalgiatrap.